that was a bop. <laughs> I was I was just dancing. I was like not expecting that to be such a good intro. I know, music. right? What? Um, hi, everyone. So excited to be here. We are here to talk about this amazing anthology that we're all so lucky and uh, honored to be a part of. Um, what I would love to do is just start going around just so everyone can introduce themselves um, and talk about their piece. Just give us an intro to your piece, the title, and anything else you want to say about it. So we can just go around on my uh, screen. I have Jasmine right next to me. So let's start with Jasmine. Hello, <clears throat> thank you. Yes, uh, so excited to be here uh, as always. I am Jasmine Mendez, Dominican American uh, poet, author, writer, playwright, etc. cetera. And um, my essay is titled Aliayo, um, which uh, translates to one for whom bread or food is not enough. Uh, and my essay just looks at my experience uh, in the theater world and how that shaped uh, my understanding of being Black and Latina and growing up in the South um, and just kind of looking at how I use the theater to, to understand myself better um, throughout the years. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's move on to Sericia. Hi, I'm Sericia J. Fennell, and I am the editor slash author of, of this wonderful collection. And I'm so excited to, to be here hanging out with all of these wonderful contributors. And it's so awkward for me not to be the moderator, Natasha, I have to say, because I'm like, I want to scream and talk about all of your pieces. Um, so we'll see how this goes, y'all. Just prefacing that because <laughs> I might like fire back questions to you. Um, but my my essay is titled Half In, Half Out, Orbiting a World Full of People of Color. And um, it talks about my experience kind of, you know, learning about identity, um, being taken out of my world of people of color, being placed into foster care, living with white people for a little bit, and then landing at... Um, uh, one of my cousins uh, in my aunt's house and sort of really coming to terms in the Bronx with how like diverse it was and filled with all of these wonderful different groups of people who automatically assumed that I was one thing and then me sort of discovering that I was actually another thing. Um, it, it also talks a little bit about hair, talks a little bit about anti-Blackness um, and also lots of research that I've been doing just to figure out where I actually come from um, so that I can sort of decide how I wanna navigate the world and, and identify as a, um, not just a person of color, but like within the Latinx umbrella Thank you. And don't worry, I like already had thought that at some point I was just going to pass the mic over to you. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Mark. Hi, everyone. I am Mark Oshiro. I'm a young adult and middle grade author uh, of books like Each of Us a Desert and the recently released Insiders. Uh, my piece, which I feel very lucky, gets to open the collection. I've never had one something in an anthology be the first thing so it's really cool um it's called eres un pocho it is a weird second person letter to myself over the years that is sort of doing a reckoning with what it means to be a transracial adoptee um despite being latinx i was adopted by a um a japanese hawaiian dad and a white mother and sort of addressing the disconnect over the years of what what it means um to be Latinx and not understand yourself when you're not raised in a culture at all, um, but also doing some very important reflection about what I can do as a Latinx person to not only figure out where I belong, but what, how do I move through the world without harming other people? Um, so yeah, uh, I'm very proud of it. And I'm, I'm so glad Seriously asked me to be a part of it and didn't turn me away from writing this really weird piece when I turned it in and I remember being like, I don't know, this is weird. I've never written anything like this. So I'm very happy that it's in the, the anthology. I love it. It was, it's so, it's the per, it's the perfect piece to start this anthology. I think, I think that was a really brilliant move. Um, Lillian. Hi, um, I'm Lillian Rivera and um, I feel really blessed to, to be here with all these amazing, um, contributors and writers that I admire and people who navigate this publishing journey, which is always such a 
um, crazy roller coaster kind of a ride. So I feel like every one of us have been really kind of honest and raw. Um, you know, just in our public, you know, persona, we're just really honest, and that's what I, what I, what I value. So um, I write young adult, middle grade. My latest came out just uh, I think a week before this anthology came out. We light up the sky. Um, my essay is called "More Than Nervio Nervios." And it's about my 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 continuous bout with depression and um, suicide ideation and um, and and how it, it has affected my life throughout my year you know throughout my whole life you know as a young person and how my parent my family deals with kind of just even seeking out mental health um, issues and um, and how we you know how we talk about it and um, I felt really kind of it felt cathartic to even write that essay even though I still feel nervous that people are going to read it. Is that weird? <laughs> but no, yeah. I mean, yeah, it was so, and it's such an honest and um, it's scary to be that honest, I feel like. Um, and I think it's going to help so many people to, to read that and see that bravery come from you. Um, so I'm Natasha Diaz. I forgot to say that in the beginning. Um, my poem, which I didn't know I was going to be allowed to submit. I like was having a lot of difficulty coming up with an essay. And when I'm in that space with writing, I just write poems. So I just wrote a poem and was like, sorry, here you go. <laughs> um, it's called Caution Song. And it is about uh, my struggle being multiracial and specifically Brazilian and how because I look white and don't speak Portuguese, the way that um, I'm sort of um, the way people react to me telling them I'm Brazilian is to sexualize that and exoticize that. And I hate it. And so I wrote a really angry poem about that. Um, great. Okay. So the thing, so I reread all of our pieces this morning as my child was screaming in my ear. And um, we all wrote such completely different pieces. Um, but the, the theme that I found that that was present in all of them was this idea of trying to fight back against this idea of, of what it means to be Latinx, how all of us, there are certain ways that you, that fit. And if you aren't in that way, you don't talk about it and you're supposed to just live that, live with that hidden inside of you. Um, and I wanted just everyone to talk about how that specific theme, because it was really present in all of our pieces, even if it was about, wasn't necessarily about the way you look or if it was about mental Ill, mental health or, you know, there's certain things that you're just as expected not to have as a part of your ident your outward identity. Um, how that came into your writing and if it was something that you intentionally put in or you realized after was sort of a subconscious thing um, that you, incorporated into the piece and whoever wants to jump in. Um, I can go first. I um, So interesting too, because when I was writing this and it was actually when, when Sirisu was doing edits, um, she pushed me pretty hard to like fill in some of the gaps where it was clear I was referencing something but not talking about it. And I know why I didn't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable and it's uncomfortable to talk about your history um, especially familial history when it's not pretty, when it's not nice. Um, and so one of the memories that I really wanted to delve into was the literal first time my twin brother and I saw another Latinx person, which was in Adelanto, California, as we were moving from Boise, Idaho to Riverside, California. And having this, and I, it was one of those memories, like as a kid that was so striking I, I can relive that whole dinner that we had on the side of the road, you know, at this little tiny diner restaurant thing where they advertised. The whole thing was that they advertised it was authentic Mexican food. And at that point, the only place I'd ever eaten at that had Mexican food was this place called Taco John's, which is a chain in the like Midwest Rockies area. That's not <laughs> it makes Taco Bell look spicy. Like that's how bad it like it's not good. Except for they had these little potato things called potato alays, and they were really good. But that's fried potatoes. You can't mess it up. So we're eating at this place, and not only was the food unlike anything I had ever had, but there was this bizarre exchange where the waitress came over, and you know, and she had a very thick accent, and she took our order, and she just kept looking at me and my brother as if we were a puzzle to be figured out, as if 
this is something that doesn't make sense, which then is me at eight years old. I'm like, I, this doesn't make sense. I don't know why this is happening. And I will never forget her walking into the back and placing the order or giving her order to the cook and her, I thought she was just like generally pointing at the table to be like, oh, it's their food. And it took me a second to realize that she was pointing us out. And it was the first of many times, um, especially once we moved to Southern California, where people would just see our family and be like, you don't make sense. Um, sometimes, it, sometimes it was, you don't make sense. <laughs> Every once in a while, it was also, were you kidnapped? We don't know what's going on here. And so I, I've talked to other people who, you know, were our transitional adoptees over the years. Um, and they have expressed a very similar sentiment that people are so used to, you know, sort of monoracial families. Um, and this also happens a lot with multiracial families, too, that that they don't recognize you because you don't fit this mold of who you are supposed to be. <clears throat> and instead of dealing with that themselves, they usually put it on the kid. Um, and so that was the start of many identity issues that I had growing up. And so a lot of my piece is rooting is rooting you know the reader in that moment of realizing there's something off there's something weird it's not the sort of you know racial hang up you expect it's not something that's talked about a whole lot um and taking it from that point and then just i mean we all know this this world is terrible at teaching us this stuff i mean you talk about i i seriously you and i have talked about this so much too about how much research we've had to do to just understand ourselves. Let Don't even get into like family and then community, larger community issue, just to understand yourself and how many people in this world, like they don't have to do that at all. Like I, I remember as a kid being jealous of other people who could go to school and give their family tree presentation and be able to go back like 10 generations. And I'm like one, my dad, I don't know where he is. Like I'm adopted. I don't know anything. Like that's all. I don't, have the ability to do that. Um, so a lot of my piece is 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 trying to make a reckoning with that. What does it mean when you literally can't find out what your past is? Yeah, I think I'll go next. I think for me, most of my piece is why does society keep trying to tell me who I am? And and so it just it just really ignited this fire in me where I was just like, no, I kind of need to know, <laughs> especially because if you know me as a person, I'm very independent and like I like to make really informed decisions. And I'm like, I can't really do that if I don't if I don't have the history or if I don't know, you know, where we come from. And 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 like Mark just pointed out, like the family tree and everything, it's like okay, what the hell's going on? Because, <laughs> you know, society's telling me and, and, and at one point when I'm eight years old, oh, you're, you're just black, like you're, you're black. But then I leave, you know, that white space in Brooklyn and go into the Bronx where it's heavily Puerto Rican in the South Bronx and like heavily Dominican a little further up in the Bronx. And that was, it, you know, for, for most of the Latinx people, you identified as one of those two things. Um, and so it was really interesting to me because of course, you know, seeing another kid of color ask me, <laughs> what are you like where are you from it was different from like the white kids asking me like what are you where are you from because i'm like oh well this is another person of color and i actually didn't know what to say because for the white kids i could just say like i'm black like you you can you know you can see that on me but the interesting thing when we're around people of color they know like oh you're a person of color like i can clearly i can tell by your features so like what's up where, where are you from like what are your roots and I was just dumbfounded. And so, of course, when my cousin was like, well, she's the same thing as me, you know, she's like, leave her alone. Like, she's Puerto Rican and Honduran. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not. I like that. That is the thing that I am. And so I just kind of like hooked onto it. And I feel like as young people, we do that a lot. Like we take our cues from other people that we're really close with who seem to know, you know, way, way more, um, <laughs> way more about the world. And so I just looked up to my cousin and I was like, yeah, if she's saying that she's we're Puerto Rican and Honduran, then that's what we are. And then, you know, fast forward later, my mom's like laughing and she's like, no, you're not Puerto Rican. Like your cousin. <laughs> yeah. She's, she has Puerto Rican roots because her dad is Puerto Rican, but like, that's, that's not you, you know, you're Honduran. And then of course I'm like, all right, now I know how to navigate the world. I can like tell people exactly, you know, what, what my family roots are. But then once again, 
I'm in high school now, and of course, I get to see more Hondurans because I find out that the Bronx also has a very large population of Hondurans. And so I'm really excited, and I'm in high school, and I'm hanging out with a really close friend, and we get to talking and bonding, and she's like, are you Garifuna? And I'm like, I don't know what that is. And she's like, well, some of the stuff that we're talking about seems like you know, you could you could possibly be Garifuna. And she, she starts to ask, like, where, where you know, where's your family from in Honduras? And I tell her, like, oh, my mom's from La Ceiba, et cetera, et cetera. And she's like, okay, okay. Then it, there's this running joke within the Honduran community. You have to ask about last names or tias or tios because there's, you, you always end up being related to somebody, whether it's like through blood or through marriage. It's really funny. And so we start going over this history and I'm like, oh, my God, like, we actually might be really be related. So I, like, go home, talk to my mom, and my mom's laughing. And she's like, oh, yeah, you are, you know, like, we are Garifuna. And, like, and I'm, like, mind blown because here I am having another person once again see something in me or or something about our culture and realize, like, oh, you're also this. But I, I never had the name for it because, it's you know, it just wasn't how I was raised. And so I just found that to be really interesting. And I was like, you know what, I need to just do more research because clearly there are certain things that are passed down, oral traditions that are passed down, but they, name, they may not actually be named. And so I'm doing the thing or, you know, learning about the history, but don't actually have the name for it. And so when people ask me these questions, I'm like, I don't know the name for it, but that sounds like this thing that I used to do with my family or that I grew up doing. So it's just so fascinating to me that like, as people of color or even society, like sometimes they do see things in us and they're in, in, you know, they could be right. But then also that's like the double edged sword of stereotypes, right? Where it's like, sure, there are, there are certain things in my culture that are like that, but like not everyone is is like that. And so my essay is sort of unpacking like what, you know, what does it mean for society to reflect a certain identity back on me? But what does it mean for me to actually do the research and figure out, is that something I want to identify with or something I kind of like don't want to identify with? And I think it's really important especially for young people. because so I remember being a teen and trying on different identities. It's just what you do, right? Like I, my whole sophomore year, I wore black and everyone was like, why are you dressing so emo? So like you just adapt these different, you know, things. And, and I want young people to know that it's okay. Just continue to do your research and you can kind of figure out who you are and you don't have to be the same person that you were yesterday. But it is important for you to know the history behind it so that when people come to you, <laughs> you know what you're representing. And I'll tag on to that and just say, so speaking of trying to be different people and different identities, um, I fully embrace that throughout uh, middle and high school and college with uh, doing theater um, and then acting on stage because I wanted to take on different identities um, and personas. Uh, because I was told uh, my whole life that I was not enough of one thing or the other. I was not Black enough. I was not Latina enough. I was not American enough. I was not Dominican enough. I was never enough of anything, um, especially being raised in the South where there were no Dominicans <laughs> for the most part. Um, and, you know, when I always make the writing joke that like whenever um, I would make a friend in school, it was usually like the one Puerto Rican. So it was like me, the Puerto Rican and the Dominican were like best friends because it was like the closest you know, type of, uh, you know, background that was similar to my own identity that I could relate to. Um, and so, you know, it was looking and exploring at why um, the world kept telling me, you know, that I was not really Black and I was not Latina and I didn't look Latina and I wasn't really Black because I had to be mixed with something because I had good hair and like lighter skin and I spoke Spanish and people were constantly confused. Um, and so I used the theater as a way to become who I wanted to be, become something else, anything else other than this person that was not enough other than other than myself. Um, but then realizing throughout that process, right, that um, the theater space uh, was also, I was still not going to be enough in that space either, right? I was not, I was never going to be the right skin color or the have the right kind of hair to have and take the parts that I wanted to have um, and to really be able to sort of shine in this space because it was because you know the racism that exists within the theater world, um, and and they sort of couch it under typecasting, and you know you don't fit the part, um, and so sort of really feeling kind of betrayed by that, 
Um, and it was, a, it was a difficult essay to write. It, it may not seem that way, but it was one of those things that I hadn't really reckoned with that I always uh, downplayed as like, that's just the industry, or we always played it off as jokes. And it's like, oh, you know, they they don't do plays, you know, before the 1960s, because, the, you know, those pre-emancipation plays, they don't, they don't do plays before the civil rights. They always do those, you know, uh, white people plays. And so that's why we don't get the parts. And we always made jokes of it. You know, we kind of made light of it. But um, in reality, it was sort of a very uh, damaging experience um, after you do it for, for so long um, and never seeing yourself, you know, never seeing your stories or yourself represented on stage um, in that way um, and always being sort of subjected, subjected to the same sort of uh, bit parts, side parts or sort of the same stereotypical parts. Um, it, it, yeah, it was a very damaging sort of experience overall, um, and I left very disillusioned um, after after being in the theater for many years. Um, and, it, and so my essay kind of explores that, um, but it does really celebrate my my entry point into the theater and how it was a very affirming place. The first time that that I you know did um, theater and performed on stage was was a very positive experience, and then just kind of how it dissolved, I guess, um, over the years. But um, but yeah, I was really exploring just. The topic that I always explore of like, what am I? Who am I? You know, why am I always being asked? What are you? Um, especially now that you know, speaking of Mark was talking about multiracial families. I have a little girl, and my husband's Mexican American, and so my daughter does not. You know, she's not black presenting, right? Um, and so when we're in public and she and I are speaking Spanish, I always get asked if I'm the nanny or like, is that my daughter? Because you know, she has you know all the things, right? It's it's all the things, and so. Um, there's just so many layers to it. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that she's able to grow up in a world that's, um, kind of less confused by her presence, by our presence. Um, and it's just, you know, kinder and gentler and, and that she will have the language that perhaps I didn't have to be able to, you know, stick a claim on, on her own identity. But yeah. God, I love all these things that you guys are saying. I mean, I, um, I think for me, because I, you know, I'm very open about my sobriety and being an alcoholic, and and the one key thing about trying, you know, trying to maintain my sobriety is being honest, and and that secrets will take me out in a lot of ways. And so, um, so just writing this essay about this really kind of um, dark period in in my life um, when I went to college, and college was the first time that I actually was away from my family, so I didn't have like the safety net of 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 keeping our secrets. You know, like it's like we could bury our secrets with alcohol and weed. You know, <laughs> like because then we're we're together, everyone is happy. You know, and so then when I was taken from that that when that equation was taken away from me, and I was placed in this kind in this school. Um, you know, things got real like very quickly. You know, it, it, it dawned on me how how dark, how dark I was really feeling and how depressed I was, and um, and then I didn't have the outlet that I usually had. Um, I didn't have my family around me, and I couldn't and I couldn't express it to them. I couldn't go to them and say I do I am feeling depressed and overwhelmed, and I need help. Like they don't understand that. They understand that you need to go to school and you have a scholarship. And you need to continue. And so, um, so I, I was, you know, I just felt really kind of alone. And it was that period where I was just like, I didn't see the outlets. Like, I didn't see the escape, like the exit, you know, like the exit was very dark for me. And, um, and it's just taking me so many years to be okay with, it's okay to like, oh, I'm going to go to therapy. Like, I feel like now that's sort of opening, especially during the, this pandemic, during lockdown, that it was very open about being in like a self-care and finding ways to take care of yourself like and and i'm just like that's amazing to me because it's been you just don't talk about those things you know i don't you know i would not like my parents don't be believe in any of that they believe in going to church and praying praying away your your problems you know and um now I'm like, what can I use? You know, <laughs> like I'm like any therapy, like what's the new therapy? <laughs> like, I'm just like, I'm very open about like, oh, you know, someone's like, yeah, I'm using tarot cards. Oh, okay, I'm a, let me take a class <laughs> about reading your cards. You know, like I, I do not care. Like I will try anything because whatever tool I can use and that's my way of, of, of empowering myself 
to navigate this world that seems overwhelming too much. And I, and I could express this to young people. Like I could, ex you know, I could have that kind of conversation even with my, with my kids, my own kids, who's a teenager and one who's nine, that I could have that, that we could talk about like how, what can I do to help? Like, what can we, can we talk about? Like, you know, what tools we can use? Do you want to talk to a talk doctor? You want to talk to a therapist? This is not a conversation that ever happened in my family. Like we, we just don't, you know, I see my, my, my parents who are older and, and retired and, and dealing with certain, you know, health issues. And, and I'm just, you know, I'm, we try to like, oh, do you feel, are you sad? That's like unheard of <laughs> for me to ask my mom, do you feel sad? Like my, my mom's like, sad, who has time for that? Like who has time for that? You know? And I'm just like, you know, it's okay to take a moment, take a moment, and acknowledge these, these emotions that, that no one gives you a moment to do, you know, no one, no one's allowed, like, I really did believe, and that was what was part of the essay is like the luxury of, of pausing, you know, is very, we don't have that luxury, I feel, a lot of, Latin, you know, Latin, Latinx, we don't, and so it was really important to, to be that reminder in that essay of like, you do, you know, you have to because they're trying to kill us, you know? <laughs> like you have to, like, it's like, they are really, you know, this idea of working until you, you, you know, until you're dead is not, that's not what we're meant to do. We're meant to, to pause, <laughs> I really believe. So, and that's a reminder for me to do, because, um, yeah, this, the hustle is not going to save me. That's for sure. So <laughs> that's what I wanted to write about. And I'm, I'm lucky that I was able to, to do that. Yeah. I, I, there were so many times when all of you were talking about it. I was like, oh, my God, yes, yes. I, and that was one of the things I, I just love. And, again, like props to Cerecia because, you know, we're, so many of the contributors, we're all from such different backgrounds, so many different places. We all live in different parts of the country. And I almost every piece I could relate to still, you know, and so I, I feel like this book, it, you know, even if you aren't part of the Latinx umbrella, I think that there, these are such universal experiences. And um, it's a really powerful read, just simply because it's relatable in that way. So um, so that last answer, Lillian's last answer was perfect for my next question, which is, you know, we all got like pretty deep in our pieces. And have you had any family members read your piece? And has that opened up any conversation? Or are you not comfortable? Like, or is that something that you don't talk about? Like, what is the what is the response or not response been? I am cracking up because <laughs> I'm experiencing this right now. I don't know if you follow me on Twitter, but I've definitely tweeted about this. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> this is this is it's it's so funny and comical to me because I knew that there were going to be people who picked up the book, who would read these, who would read this collection. And for some people, they would read it and think, oh, it's this is this has to be fiction. Like this cannot be their lives. Like this cannot be a thing that had happened to them. Um, and then I have my family members who have picked up this essay or picked up the book and have read the essay. And I feel like <laughs> I'm laughing so hard. It's not funny, but it's just so comical to me because family members that I haven't spoken to in over a decade, just because for various reasons, we've had complicated relationships and, you know, just try to put the distance like I love you, but I'm going to love you from a distance. And they've been calling my mom because they know not to call me. They know I'm not going to pick up. So they've been calling my mom, calling my sisters, like calling my brother, like everyone else. And so like the family group chat has been on fire. Oh, do you, you know the bleaching cream like that is the thing everyone has like hooked on it's it was the bleaching cream and then the other thing was why are you telling people <laughs> why are you why are you telling people that um you didn't know where you came from like 
you 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 you've always known and i'm like well technically no one ever really told me that i was honduran like i didn't see it stamped on my forehead you know and i was walking around like no that that was not a thing that happened but it was the bleaching cream that really got a lot of my tias so the older the elders in the family really got their panties in a bunch and i was like well but this was a thing that we did and then i have you know cousins that are 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 white right they have fair skin and so they're they're like I never like Thea never told me to do that or mommy never told me to do that and I'm like I'm laughing on the phone with my mom because I'm like but mommy they are, do they have black skin like why why would why would they tell them to use bleaching cream and so the one thing I've been saying about the whole entire time that I've been promoting this anthology is that it will be a conversation starter, no matter what. It's going to bring up those rough topics that people in your family or people in your friend group never want to talk about. And I said it to people, I said, we love to talk about other people. And so I obviously talked about other family members telling me, put the bleaching cream on your, on your knees and your elbows. And it ruffled some feathers and, and it brought people, you know, like I said, that I haven't talked to in years to the forefront to, to, to tackle this. And they're like, oh, I don't understand. Like, why would she, why would she say that she's bringing shame to the family? And my mom is like, it's not about bringing shame. It's about having these conversations about why, why did we do that? You know, why did we tell the darker skinned, um, you know, people in our family that this was something they needed to do? Why did we tell them, you know, not to go into the sun? Or like, if you're going to go into the beach, don't go, you know, you go either before the sun is highest out in the sky, or you go after the sun is, you know, highest out in the sky. And like some of my, I didn't put this in my essay, but I'm like, there's so many other memories where certain family members would like, lather themselves up in baby oil to go to the beach but when it came to me it's like put this sunblock on because it it, it, it was so weird to me because I'm like no I want the baby oil like I want to get a tan too but then at the same time they're like you're dark enough like you are dark enough you don't need to be darker so instead put sunscreen on and I, and I think about those memories and as these conversations have been cropping up you know even with hair where my sister was like you know, when's the last time you checked me about your hair? And I was like, well, before I got these braids or before I got these faux locks, we were actually just talking about that. I said, it's still very present. And my sister laughed. She said, you're right. I'm always telling you to go and relax your hair because I, I like it when your hair is straight. And I said, that's your preference, not mine. You know, and so we were able to have another meaningful conversation to talk about why we, you know, why we have these different standards of beauty and why she prefers to relax her hair and wear her hair straight and why I prefer to hair natural. And so it's been very interesting to me, like I said, because people I haven't spoken to in a really long time have come out of the woodwork and they're like, oh, I think you're mis you know, mis misremembering. And I'm like, am I though? I don't know. Like I've always had darker skin than you. So though we were both at the same functions, Clearly, the elders were having different conversations with each of us about what we could and could not do. And then, you know, it even evoked other uh, memories for some of my other cousins who were my age. And they were like, yeah, I remember like, you know, going to the family pic picnic and being told like I couldn't eat bread or like certain things. And, and, and it's just been a, such a dynamic conversation to have with my loved ones because we all knew, like the people who are my age in my family, we all knew <laughs> and experienced these things. And we would talk about it on the side. We wouldn't talk about it with the elders. But now it's like we're having these conversations with the elders. And we're like, no, but you, this is what you told me at this age. And this is what you did to me. And here's why I think we should talk about it now so that you don't do it to your grandchildren or to, you know, to your grandniece or your grandnephew or et cetera. And it's been a very eventful week for me and I, I have been fascinated by it and I, I really want to give kudos to my family for even discussing it because, you know, for some of these things, they would either just disown you or say like, you know, she's out here telling lies, she's out here telling secrets, we're not going to speak to her anymore, but that that is the, the thing that's happening, we're, we're talking about it, and so for me, it's been a very real visceral experience, and 
I, 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 you know, I hope that um, more conversations will continue to happen. And I hope the readers out there that you're using this in the same way, you know, I, I, I'm so curious if Mark, Lilium, you know, Jasmine, Natasha, if there are people in your family that have read your piece and are, you know, frowning upon it or patting you on the back for saying things like, thank you for talking about this stuff. But I'm sure, I'm sure we all have at least one person in our family where it's a pain point and they're like, why did you write that thing? <laughs> Uh, I'm, oh, I'm so ready. You actually kind of know the answer to this, Cerise. So a year ago, Cerise and I did an own workshop together with a few of our friends at Highlights. And I don't know if you remember, Cerise, but I was in the middle of a whole bunch of family drama about my adoption. Um, and so actually, at, I while I was writing, oh yeah, I have an update for you next time I see you. It's interesting. I won't go into it here. But the, the, the short of it is that someone from... Uh, my biological mother's family found my brother on Facebook and we got a whole bunch of information um, about our adoption. I'm not going to go into that stuff, but I will say that because of that was happening at the same time as I was drafting it, my brother and I were in constant conversation. And so I was talking to him about this piece and I had this idea and I'm going to write this weird little letter to myself. But the fascinating thing is that every once in a while, me and my brother will sit down and sort of compare our, like what our memory was of childhood and it has been really interesting, um, both as twins, but also as, you know, kids who are sort of treated as one unit, because it's an interesting thing that happens with twins a lot of time is people don't see us as two separate people. We're just one unit. It's like the only way I know how to describe it. Um, and so, you know, I asked him, do you remember the Mexican restaurant? He's like, oh, yeah, I remember. And he just tells me without even the prompting. Like, I just said, do you remember the restaurant? And he just tells me, like, I remember she she looked at us weird and she went back to the kitchen and like pointed us out. So um, that and many of the other things throughout it, you know, he was like, yeah, no, that's exact. Your perception of it was correct. And so what's interesting about that, too, and what I hope the piece does as well, is that I think we unfortunately live in a world in which adults don't believe children. They just don't. And to get that perspective and realize the things that I went to went through and the way I perceived them was correct. I'm like, okay, I think we need to give more credence to children and how they perceive what is happening to them. Um, especially when they have this perception that things maybe weren't as, you know, rainbows and sunshine as, as the family says it is. Um, other than that, no, I don't think there's anyone else. Who read the if they did they kept the, the, their opinion to themselves i mean i yeah. feel the same way like i don't think anyone's reading my piece yeah. and if they are they're talking about it behind my back you know because <laughs> that's the way they handle everything they're just like yeah. oh no me that but and also i think because i live so far away it's different because if yeah. i were with them all the time then they would be like we would be having this kind mm -hmm. of conversation, you know? And, but since I'm so far away, oh, you know, she's she's over there doing her writing thing and that doesn't yeah. affect us. And I'm like, you know, people, it's in a book, guys. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's real. <laughs> like, so. Yeah, same, same. <laughs> I don't think anyone's read it yet, um, but I will say, and it's also not my first foray into like personal narrative memoir. And so I, I, I sold a lot of things in my, my first two memoirs. So at this point, they just know like, Yamina la que dice todo. Ella está ahí hablando de la familia. Like she's the one that's just out there talking about the And my mom just loves to say, I only remember the bad stuff. And I'm like, that's, that's not, I do remember good times too. So she just kind of like, you just remember all the bad things I ever did. I'm like, that's not true. Um, so I think they just, again, say that like they're used to just me run in my mouth and they don't really <laughs> hit any more mind at this point. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I um, I don't think too many people have read it yet, but the people who have were just like, this just sounds so like you. Like the like way that I wrote it, they were like, there's no one else who could have written this. This just sounds exactly like you. So I'll, I took that as a compliment and I was like, I guess I'm just angry then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we are actually getting close to uh, our time limit, and I want to give our fearless leader, Cerecia, some time to uh, hit us with some questions before we have some awesome kid questions thrown at us. So if you have anything you want to ask, feel free. If not, I can keep going. Oh, man. I mean, these questions that you've asked have already been so good. Um, but I, I think the one thing I wanted to ask for each of you is, um, you know, coming into this, because it was a very collaborative process. I remember asking all of you, write a couple pitches and let's figure out, you know, what you're pulled to, to write. Um, 
And so why did you decide to sort of like focus on this moment in your life? And what do you want readers to take away from it? Um, you know, I think for myself, I just want them to know that like, even though society will constantly tell you, you are one thing, you can be whatever you want. Like, I, I, I love that. It's like just shattering the image of what people will put in their mind for you. And I think I lead my life that way as well. What people will, oh, will love to say, like, you can't do this thing. And I'm like, but why not? guess what? I did it. It's done there. <laughs> so I, I, I constantly want people to believe in themselves because, you know, it, it's such a powerful thing. Um, so I, you know, I think for me, Lillian, for you, especially with your essay, um, we've talked about this before, but rates among, you know, like young people, but suicide rate among, among young people is really high. And I, I remember having some friends who had close calls in high school. And so um, just your essay, I was like, oh, just to have a powerful YA writer talk about this in this way. I just think that it's going to show them that there's another way to, to, to handle things. You know, you don't always have to turn to that thing. Um, and, and I think, you know, with, with Jasmine, with your essay in high school, there were so many things that I wanted to try out for, but I just felt like, you know, I don't fit, I don't fit. So I can never be on stage. But I remember a, a teacher who was actually a Latina. She changed my entire life. She turned one of my poems into a play and she said, we're going to make you front and center. And I was like, me, but that's not normal. You know, like that's not the normal thing. And she's like, well, we're going to make it normal. And so I feel like you, you know, centering these, these things in your, in your lives have just been amazing. And Natasha Brazilians being fetishized is like the, the number one thing that not just for Brazilians, but any Latin American person, you know, and I hate it. I hate it. But they're like, oh, you're supposed to be spicy. You're supposed to be feisty. And it's like, no, I'm just supposed to be human and live my life. Like I'm not supposed to be any of the things that you're you're saying. And Mark, I mean, I told you about this already, but I was so excited to have you write about being a transracial adoptee because it's not something we talk about in in our community. And you know, you always see uh, other narratives, right? But never within our within our community. But then also your uh, relationship with religion. And, um, you know, how, how you, um, came, I don't want to say came out, but like your, your experience and your journey with your queerness. And, and like, I just found that to be amazing. And so I'm just wondering, like, what do you want the readers to take away from, from each of your pieces? I know that was a very long way to come to the question. <laughs> it's interesting because I, I just was searching through email to find the answer of like, how did I come to this and I realized I didn't answer your, your emails when you were like pressing me to be like, Mark, I thought you were going to write about this. I kind of want you to write about this. And I didn't answer any of them. But I remember you because I had originally pitched like I wanted to talk about this specific word and the usage of the word pocho and what it means and to be on the receive again. And then you were like, OK, I think you should do make sure to stick to the nonfiction angle. And then the next email literally like. A week later, you're like, um, I thought you were going to write about adoption too. And I didn't answer it. So I feel really bad. But that became, it got stuck in my head. And I was like, well, how do I talk about these two things? Because once I think about it, they're interrelated. Like there's no way to talk about what this means without talking about being adopted. Um, so yeah, it was, it's all your fault is basically the answer to that. Um, and again, I, I, I think it really goes back to, I just want adults to believe children. I think that's really what I hope this story does is just the things that they're going through are real. And just because they're younger when they're experiencing it doesn't make it any less real. And so much of my childhood would have gone completely differently if people just believed me. Like, and that includes, you know, the, the you know, I, I do talk about in the essay, the kids who would call me that word. And I'd be like, I'm not, I didn't sell out anything. Like I didn't, I didn't, get, I was forced, like this is all forced upon me, this culture, I did not choose this. And even those kids didn't believe me and some some of the teachers too. Um, so yeah, so I think that is what I'm hoping to get with, uh, with the piece. 
So I actually feel like you summed up a lot of what we were getting at um, for us. So we have to move on to our fantastic kids questions. Um, so we're going to have them now. So we have Maximiliano K from the sixth grade in New York, New York. Where do I start if I want to write a book about a true story? Hmm. Um. Well, I'll just, and we should maybe do this like lightning round. So I'll start like, so my, my debut color me in is based off my own experiences. And I literally started it with a memory. I, I did a memory. It was something actually that Jasmine, you were talking about that you experienced with your daughter, where my mom kept get being mistaken as my nanny when she would take me to the playground. And so I used that memory and the pain from that memory. And then from that, I sort of just let the experience come out in the book as, you know, it did. So I think choosing a memory or an experience and going from there is a really good idea. You don't have to have the whole big picture. You can start from a small seed and it'll grow. And I would say just take that memory and maybe make a list of all the sensory details that come up from it. What did you see, hear, smell, taste? What was the feeling that those sensory experiences gave to you? Did somebody say something? Do you remember the color of the sweater? Was it raining? Just kind of making a list of those details, because again, all of that can also grow and could potentially become a metaphor for something that carries the book throughout or that anchors the book and the story later on. So, um, A thing I did with Anger is a Gift, because there's a lot of it that is based on things that I went through, is to actually take it the other direction where I wrote, what if something else had happened? and take the real thing and to create separation between you and the thing that really happened to you is to take it. Yeah. And you could also do it into fantasy and speculative fiction. What if there's a completely different outcome? What if it happens in space? What if, you know, so then it's still rooted in something real, but you can also tell um, a different story. I love that. I don't have anything to add. This, this is all fabulous. <laughs> Great advice. I was just going to say, just write for yourself and don't worry about who's going to read it. Because if not, then you won't write the truth. So that's that's. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I feel like that's all really perfect, great advice. Let's get on to the next one. So we have Andre C in the ninth grade in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Esther or a plotter? Um, Panther or a plotter? I'm a panther. <laughs> I'm a very big plotter. I tried to start pantsing for NaNoWriMo this month and it was like, I just became overwhelmed. Like I pants for a little while and then I was like, I don't know where this is going. So then I like took everything I had and like started plotting everything on note cards, <laughs> very detailed. So. I, mean, I write um, thousands, thousands of words worth of outline. Yeah, I, um, I have one short story I've never finished and it's the only thing I've ever attempted to pants. I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm a plotter, but then when I start to write, I allow myself to be a panther. Mm. Mm. I, yeah, I, um, in books and poetry, I'm a panther, and in screenwriting, I'm a plotter. Mm. Oh, yeah. I think you got to be a plotter for screenwriting. Yeah, otherwise it's chaos. Absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, let's go on to, I think we have one more question. Autumn G, fifth grade in Olympia, Washington. Why is this book special to you? Um, oh, this is the sweetest question. Well, I mean, I think we, throughout this conversation, we've talked about why this book is so important. I will say personally for me, um, when I think about my multiracial identity, I often try to I often find myself subconsciously boxing out my Brazilian heritage because it's the part of my, my background that I feel like is the most easily um, erased because I don't speak Portuguese. Um, I wasn't born in Brazil um, and I wasn't necessarily raised in a Brazilian community outside of my family, like the neighborhoods and the areas that I lived in, there weren't a lot. There was a lot of Latinx people, but not Brazilian specifically. And so uh, when I wrote Color Me In, the thing that I regret most, I think I've, I've said this to Cericia, is that I didn't make Nevea the main character uh, Black, Jewish, and Brazilian. I only made her Black and Jewish because in my head I was like, that feels like too much. But then I was like, wait, but like, that's literally who I am. How is that too much? I'm alive. And so being able to, um, present myself as my full self in this book was really special and important to me. To me, it was special. Um, it is special because I don't 
recall, I'm pretty sure, I'm 95% sure I'm not in any other anthologies with this much Black Latinx representation. Um, and so it's one of the very few times that I haven't felt tokenized. Um, and to me, that was really just special and important to know that I was alongside so many wonderful um, writers in general, but just the fact that there's so many Afro-Latinx representation, so much Afro-Latinx representation of, of Afro-Latinx writers that I really like admire and respect. And I'm like, oh my God, little old me, like this book, uh, this is amazing. So um, it just was really special in that regard. And to know that hopefully it's gonna be a staple in schools across you know, the world maybe, who knows? Yeah, I think for me, putting together this collection, I really wanted to focus on um, just writers like, you know, Lilium had mentioned er earlier, who are very honest in their persona and, and are kind of like raw. And I figured this is exactly what young people need. They need people who write wonderful fiction, but also like can talk about their lives in a very dynamic way to let them know that they're not alone in the world. This is totally a collection that I could have used as a teenager. Um, you know, in everyone's essay, like Natasha said, I identify with something and um, it's so powerful and I'm really excited for young people to read it, for older people to read it and for it to be taught in the classroom because you this this is the Latinx diaspora. Like there's white Latinx, indigenous Latinx, queer Latinx, black Latinx, you know, almost every type of you know Latinx story that you can think of, it's in this an anthology. And um, I really think that, you know, I hope it sets the precedent for publishing. I'm I'm really excited to see like in the coming years, Wild Tongues meets X for for these new books because I'm like this this is authentic representation. This is how you capture Latin American countries. You know, I'm sure I'm missing many, but to have all of the, the Caribbean, you know, Central America represented was really important to me. I think and that's I'll, it for me. That's all I was like that, that I was like, <laughs> yeah, that getting to be, and I feel Lillian the same with you too, because we both wrote such like deeply personal things too, is like, I never felt like I couldn't be honest. And I love that I got to be my whole self in the whole piece. I do too. It is, it's, and it, it is, um, it is because of you Salatia, that you were able to like really curate this, this anthology and make, these conversations available for everyone so yeah so <laughs> i just want to wrap up because we this has been such a great conversation i wish we, we could be chatting more because i love talking to all of you so much um let's let this panini end so we can get together in person and do in-person book events um uh, thank you, Sericia, for bringing this dream to life and for giving us all the chance to put ourselves in this honest, raw way on the page. Um, and I just truly think it's going to change so many young people and older people who, as you said, needed this book growing up lives. I think it's it's going to really make a mark. So we're all so fortunate to have you in the book world and on our side. Thank you. And thank you to all of you. Seriously, this would, there would be no anthology without your contribution. So thank you.